welcome to the Marina Skewer podcast. Today I've got various projects to show you in different stages of completion. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some knitting, some de-knitting, um, some fibre prep, and then later on, owing to popular demand, uh, there's going to be a little look at the front garden here which is very much a work in progress and there's still lots of work to be done but I know some of you are keen to see what's happening there and to hear about plans. So I'm going to start by talking about what I'm wearing because I love this outfit, um, just lots and lots of fluffy hand spun. Uh, so the top I'm wearing is Ironwork by Diana Waller. I spun the yarn for this one uh, quite a while ago, a few years ago, um, and you will see this yarn again in a little bit. Uh, so low contrast, nice bit of colour work. It's a t-shirt so it is short sleeved and I really like it. I've got lots of Angora fluff in here which makes it really really fuzzy and this is sort of the perfect time of year for it, kind of transitional weather when I still want a bit of warmth um, because it's not super toasty outside but also I don't mind the fact that it's a bit cropped and so there's some breeziness and that balances out with the super long cardigan um, which again is hand spun. I made this one more recently. I spun the yarn over the summer of 2021 yeah, 2021, and then finished it um, early on last year. Um, so the pattern is the Gown Cardigan by Irene Lynn. Uh, I really love this cardigan uh, because, well, it was exactly what I needed to make at the time, and I really like how it works with the hand spun. Um, but the pattern really isn't size inclusive, uh, so I'm hesitant to recommend it. Like, it's a nice enough pattern. Um, and it shouldn't be too difficult to modify to make in larger sizes because it's just got straight raglan increases so you could just do more increases um, but at the same time it's not written to be size inclusive and you shouldn't have to do that amount of maths if you're going to knit a larger size. Um, so yeah, like I, I still love this cardigan and I'm still going to wear it but um, it would be nice if it were available in larger sizes. Um, so yes, I said that you were going to see more of this yarn, so I will show you now what I am doing with it. So when I was spinning for this project, because sometimes I spin yarn specifically with a project in mind, which was the case with this one, and then with others I spin up a garment quantity or a the quantity of fibre I have available and then decide what to do with it afterwards. So that was the case with this one. I spent a long time looking for a pattern that was what I wanted from it um, and that meant that I, yeah, I didn't check that it was a size inclusive pattern that I wanted to support. But I ended up spinning this yarn much much finer than expected and it worked completely fine for this pattern because it's got so much fuzz to it that um, it like it fills in all the gaps so you can work it at various gauges because um, it's a an angora mohair alpaca I think there's a fair bit of blue faced Leicester maybe some Shetland tees water wool in there and as I've been knitting I've definitely found little bits of flax so there's a lot of different stuff in here um, and I'll talk a little bit more about my approach to fibre blends for hand spun yarn with one of the other things I'm going to show you. Uh, everything's quite interconnected today. Uh, so I spun the yarn much finer than intended and that meant that I ended up with a lot left over because this only had short sleeves. I considered knitting it with longer sleeves which I think would have been really nice but it would have been more limiting in what I could wear it with because like it's really quite cropped and having a really cropped long sleeve thing I'd end up having a very very warm upper half but then a chilly midriff and it didn't make sense. So I had a lot of yarn left over 
and so I but not really enough that I thought I could comfortably make a garment with it but with this I am knitting it at a very loose gauge so where this I think I knitted it on three millimeter needles this I'm doing it on 4.5 and so it's a lot more open and airy and bouncy uh, the pattern is Ciro I don't know if that should be Chiro because it's the designer is Italian. Um, the designer is Valentina Cusciani and the pattern was originally published in issue six of Making Stories. And at the time, because I tech edited this pattern for the magazine, um, at the time I thought that's a lovely pattern. Uh, I, I just, I liked the look of it, but I wasn't super excited about it. And like when I was working on the magazine, which I don't anymore, um, I would always have a little mental list of the patterns that I particularly liked and if I had infinitely more time might actually make. Um, but it, it wasn't one that I necessarily considered at the time, but then I was looking for something to make out of this and just this sort of quite open lace yoke just really, really appealed to me. And the yarn I'm using doesn't necessarily show it off at its best, but I think it's one of those patterns that can work because the lace is so simple. Um, it's, it's really nice and easy to keep track of. It's easy to modify. So I've actually done, because of the gauge difference between what I'm doing and the original pattern, I've skipped off one of the yoke repeats so I didn't increase quite so much as specified in the pattern, uh, because I didn't want my yoke to get too deep. Um, but if you like a top-down yoke and you like something fairly mindless, I really, really recommend this pattern because it's loads of fun and I just think it's very pretty. And I've gone with a short sleeve version here, so you can see I've got a little bit of ribbing at the sleeves there. I mean, I'm basically almost finished. I have, where's it gone? I have this much yarn left, which is just going to be enough to do the ribbing at the bottom and then bind off. So I knew I was probably going to go for short sleeves. So I, I didn't do any additional work with the sleeves after I put them on hold. I literally just picked up the underarm sleeves and went straight into the ribbing rather than working in stockinette for the length of sleeve specified. And I think it's going to work really nicely as a sort of transitional weather floaty piece to go on top of things or underneath other things. And I'm just, I'm really, really enjoying it. I love knitting with hand spun. The yarn is just slightly ridiculous and delicious. It's got lots of little slubby angora bits in it and it's just really enjoyable and I was hoping to have this finished to show you and maybe wear but I haven't managed to finish it because I'm still really 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 catching up on everything in my life because the last few weeks have been so hectic. I went to Wonderwall um, if you came to Wonderwall, yay! I hope I got to see you. And it was it was so good. It was really nice to have the weekend to just focus on work things, to not have to worry about ill child and scheduling everything around naps and bedtimes and yeah, it was it was good to just be able to get on with things and to meet so many lovely people and to have good proper yarny creative chats and yeah it was it was a really really lovely show and I properly enjoyed myself but the run-up to it was so hectic I didn't take as much yarn as I would have liked to the show just because the child was ill beforehand and I was having to look after him rather than working um and that's just how it goes but yeah so the illness has meant that I've just got loads of stuff to catch up on um, and so I've been cramming things into the little pockets of time I have after having a bit of a rest because I was camping over the weekend 
in I think it got down to one degree on the Friday night um, and so it was it was quite chilly all weekend because it's in massive um, barns at the, uh, the Royal Welsh Showground and you know concrete floors and lots of ventilation uh, so yes I was just cold all weekend and didn't really get to rest much because I was mostly on my feet so yeah after a little bit of rest I'm now seriously working on catching up um, but yes not sure how I got onto that tangent oh yeah I wanted to have this finished so yes I've not had much time for um, personal knitting projects um, but yes on that note I'm actually going to talk a little bit about how I'm approaching dyeing going forward this year um, because I spent so much time dyeing yarn in preparation for Wonderwall so some colours have now sold out some colours I still have good stock of I still have a decent amount of yarn dyed up uh, just because I have so many colours now uh, it's I realised that once I had them all on the shelves and everything I have so many more colours than last time I did the show it I've I've gone from I think about 14 colours in total to over 30 and it's a lot it's really a lot so what I'm going to do over the summer is all of the yarn that I already have dyed will remain in stock and is ready to ship and the dyed to order options that I've had up um, since whenever I put my stock back on after I came back from maternity leave those dyed to order options will be the way to get yarn uh, if it's not in stock like I'm not going to be doing any shop updates for a couple of months at least just because I need a break from production dyeing it's been super super stressful I don't have I don't have a workspace in this house like all of my work stuff is just in corners of the living room and when I'm working I have to get it all out and then when I stop working I have to pack it all away because the child will get at it and ruin everything um, and so I just need a bit of a break from dying like production style trying to get out as many batches as I can and so I will continue to die to order uh, two week lead time on those as I've done previously I am really really happy to die to order and in terms of stock management and stuff for me it works much better because I get small batches of yarn from the mill you know I don't I can't in terms of cash flow and stuff I can't get huge batches made up all at once and that means I have to be quite careful about my, managing my stock and what colours I have in stock because if I dye a whole batch of a colour that then is less popular than one that sells out quickly it's difficult to try and keep all colours in stock at all times so over the summer if there are any of my repeatable colours on the Mendit bases that you would like they are there dyed to order and it's slightly longer lead times because I have to dye them after you've placed the order rather than them just being ready to ship that all the next day so yeah it'll just make things a little bit easier for me things tend to slow down a little bit in the summer with yarn sales anyway and then once we start getting towards autumn I will start production dyeing again that's the current plan we'll see how it goes um, I'm not saying that I won't have any like I might do some limited editions and things we'll just see I have to play it by ear because everything is changing all the time and everything feels like chaos so now I'm going to talk about a sort of in progress but future project and also a past project um, so last year I released a pattern called the Miss Lang Cardigan it was originally published in a magazine and then I self-published the pattern individually afterwards and the sample was not at all in my colour. Uh, I liked the yarn but it was a sort of pale baby pink that just isn't what I go for um, and one of the first things I did when I came back to work after maternity leave 
was I tried to over dye it into a colour that suited me better and it was not a success. Uh, I hadn't got used to new water and hob and just getting back into dyeing and everything and it didn't go very well, it turned out quite blotchy and I just wasn't able to recover it to a point that I would be happy wearing it. And so I frogged the cardigan. I really like the colour that it ended up, um, but it was just too blotchy. And so now that I've undone it, those blotchy bits, you can see some of them, uh, they, they won't be as much of a problem because they'll end up just looking like a variegated yarn once they're knitted up into something else, as long as it's, you know, a, a different item and a different stitch count and everything. So I have quite a bit of this yarn and I would like to use a decent amount of it for a cardigan for the child. Uh, I think I'll probably just do a fairly simple top-down raglan thing. Uh, we're getting out of cardigan weather now, it's quite warm. Um, I'm actually going to take off my own cardigan because it's getting quite toasty. And um, so yeah, but I'll just make it a little bit big so that hopefully it will still fit next autumn, winter. Fingers crossed, children grow ridiculously quickly, so we will see if that happens. Uh, and then I will probably also use some of it in a red scrappy jacket chunky project thing that I have been working on for ages but have actually set aside for no real reason other than I've been working on loads of other designs and I've just got distracted by other projects. But I would like to get back to that one and by the time I finish it, it definitely won't be the season for it, so... Hey ho! Uh, but yes, so... I, when I frogged it, I wound it up into skeins and have soaked them. There's still a tiny bit of kinkiness there, but it's not sort of instant noodle type kinkiness, so we're it's going to be all good to knit up and yeah, so that's that one. Um, but that does leave me without a Mistland cardigan and I do really, really enjoy the design. I, I think it's lovely. Uh, I like the sort of plain boxy body, but then elegant, slightly balloony lace sleeves. And so I really would like one and I want a neutral one that will just fit really nicely with the rest of my wardrobe because I have quite a lot of coloured bottoms like, I've got lots of red skirts and trousers and things, uh, and I would like something that will coordinate really easily with those. And I don't really have just a plain grey cardigan that's just easy to throw on top of things. So I have started blending up fibre for a hand-spun one, and this isn't all of it but we've got some. And so this is the last stage of the fiber prep because it's lots of different fibers that I'm blending together. They're all undyed, which ends up giving this really nice sort of soft pale gray, which I think is gonna be very, very pretty when I eventually get around to spinning it up. But I still have lots of carding to do. And if you're interested in the process of preparing these bats and how I blend together fibers, for a specific yarn. Uh, I have filmed it all and it's on Patreon now and subscribing on Patreon just helps keep everything going here um, and it means that you get access to loads of bonus content and discounts and things and I it's, it's really appreciated whenever anyone joins. Um, but it's that fibre is fairly characteristic of how I prepare yarn for spinning um, especially for garments, and I like blending together lots of different fibres. It's what I've done for this and for the contrast colour and for this cardigan. And it's something that I love because when you're choosing fibres for a machine spun yarn, so something that's spun up in a mill, you have to be very careful about the fibres that you combine and the suitability of the yarn for the style, the fibre for the style of spinning that you are going for. So if you're blending fibres, generally they need quite similar characteristics, like you can combine characteristics of different fibres, 
but they need to be compatible so that they can actually run through the machines because the machines rely on everything being fairly uniform and predictable to be able to create an even yarn. Whereas when you're hand spinning, you're constantly adapting and adjusting. Like if, if you're, again, spinning from something completely even, like a commercially prepared top, you won't need to do a, whole, a huge amount of that. But it means that you can get away with combining much more different fibres and you can do really interesting things. So you can combine long fibres and short fibres, you can combine really, really fuzzy fibres and quite sleek ones. And so you can just do a lot more with hand spinning and create something amazing that ends up being quite difficult to do on a machine just because everything has to be more predictable when it's machine made. Uh, and it's something that I particularly love about spinning and it's something that, although I haven't done much spinning in the last year or so, it's something that I have really enjoyed in my most recent spinning projects and would like to do more of. So yeah, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that, I'll put a link in the bio if you want to have a look at my Patreon. And there are lots of other bonus videos on there too. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to be carding up more of that fibre. As I said, it's at the final stage, so it's already been carded up and needs to be carded again just to blend it a little bit further to try and get it slightly more um, uniform so you get less of a streaky effect. And that is all the works in progress. And so I'm going to show you a cute little something. It's my only finished object to show you today, uh, but I'm really pleased with it and it is this cute little hat in John Arburn Yarnadelic. The colour is Les Fleurs. The yarn is the heavy four-ply sport weight yarn because they also have a worsted weight, yes, a worsted weight yarn, one now. Um, and it's just a cute little springy hat pattern I've designed. So the pattern is going to be coming out next week. I had intended to release it this week but just everything has got on top of me and I want to make sure that I'm able to give it the attention it needs. So I'll be doing that next week. If you want to know when the pattern comes out please subscribe to my newsletter because that's the best way to find out when things come out and yeah. So it's it's got little cables around the brim and then a sort of little sections of kind of ribbing that go up into the crown. And I've designed it to be quite a little hat because I, I wanted it to be sort of a springy hat because even though the weather's lovely at the moment, it's very changeable and it can just suddenly get rainy and chilly and I often don't have an umbrella on me and it's just really nice to have something to keep my hair dry and it looks much better when I've got a bit more curl going on with my hair and I don't have it all. Yeah, um, so yes, I think it's really sweet and these look, it's called Rosafolia because these little bits were inspired by, in the garden, which I'll show you in a minute, um, there's a rose bush and the leaves, before they turn green, when they've been coming out, have been a beautiful sort of pinky red that immediately reminded me of this. And when they open, they kind of are folded in half. And then you can just see as they open up, you can see the little veins and things on the inside as they open up. And so this was kind of inspired by the leaves when they're kind of half open. Um, and rosafolia is just very bodged Latin for rose leaf. Um, yeah, don't look for any kind of linguistic correctness there, but I like making up words. And so yes, this one's going to be out next week. There are lots of size options. So I usually I design my hats for three sizes, which is a sort of teen, then a woman's, then a man's average head, head size. So you make the one that tends to be appropriate for you. Um, with this one, this is the third size and I've done it in five sizes total. So you can either make larger sizes if you want a slightly more slouchy version, 
it's really easy to add length so if you don't want it quite so short uh, you can add some length to it it's really straightforward and the smallest sizes go down to a sort of a child size so you've got kind of well not a toddler size because the size of the repeat means that I can't go too small with it uh, but yeah little child size up to adult large and I would really love to see some versions made for people's kids because I think it would be super sweet and yeah so with that I'm gonna go out and show you the garden um, please keep in mind like we've done some work to it but it requires so much more work we've been here a year but everything else has been happening uh, so there's still loads of work to do and a lot of you said that you were keen to see the garden and so I hope that you'll enjoy seeing what's there and hopefully if I get more time over the spring and summer I'll be able to get some more of the things I'm going to mention done and I'll be able to show those to you later in the year so I hope you'll enjoy it So I'm going to try and do a quick look at what we've got going on in the front garden. So I've done a little bit of work to it, but not as much as I'd like because, well, I'm very limited on time and there is an awful lot to do. So we do have lots of plans. Uh, so this is basically it. Um, eventually I'd like to make these side beds here much wider so I'd like them to sort of scoop around and so the lawn rather than just being a rectangle ends up being more of an oval shape or sort of an almond shape. Um, so these front beds just here are ones I planted when we moved in about a year ago. Uh, they are plants that I took from the old house that we had to dig up very last minute and so I'm really pleased with how they're doing. Um, the forget-me-nots are all self-seeded, but then the lupins seem to be doing really well. Got a bit of a bare patch there, so I'll fill that in with something. Uh, there, sort of lots of misc. We've got some wood that needs chopping up and taking in. That's a rose that I'm going to plant out. I just need to find a spot for it. And then endless sweet peas. The sweet peas I've got in a uh, white and a uh, dark uh, sort of burgundy. So I think they're Swan Lake and Beaujolais. This is a plum tree. It's the child's first birthday present. Um, and we've, we're just at the end of the blossom here. So I'm hoping that we'll get some plums this year. This is my Acer. This one's called a Sakazuki. And it's really nice just seeing the leaves just beginning to come out here. Uh, then we've got a Cotinus here. Leaves just beginning to come out. And a Quince uh, Chinomalies that's just going over. Then all along here, these are mostly things that were here already, but some things I've, so up to about here, this is all new. Um, and then from here, I've replaced some things. So that little hydrangea there, you can just see it's beginning to get little flower buds on it. And then this bay, which doesn't seem to be coping well with how windy it is here. Uh, and this is a campanula here. These are things I've planted and then so eventually I'd like all of this, I'd like to dig up the grass here and make the beds much wider. And then all down here was already border but I'm, it was all full of grass and I'm fairly sure the previous owner had just mowed over everything and so it was all just mess. So I've been gradually clearing out little bits um, 
taking out things that I don't necessarily want and where I have something to replace them. So this is a Mount Etna broom that I grew from seed, from seeds that my father sent me. Um, and so I'm really pleased that that is growing nicely. This is a daylily. I'm not gonna tell you everything I've got in here because it's quite a lot. And also things aren't looking particularly interesting yet. So all along here, we've still got, you can see the sections where I've begun to do a bit more clearing and dug things out and put things back in and swap things around a bit. And so I will do another view once more things have started growing and flowering. This Mahonia is quite nice. I like the fact that it's evergreen. I like the yellow flowers. Again, it's not fared particularly well with the wind. Um, and also the st stems are looking quite bare because it did have a flowering current growing right up in the middle of it. So it's all splayed out. So I'm once it's finished flowering, I'm going to sort of chop off each of the stems um, about a third of the way down. And then hopefully it will regrow. And then this bit down here um, was just grass. And so I'm gradually planting it up with bigger things. So the hedge there uh, wasn't maintained very well. There was a lot of dead hedge in there. And so I've cut it back quite dramatically uh, and I, I'm trying to get the lower growth down here to grow in, just to hide the view of the road. And then all around here, this will eventually all be dug up. At the moment, I've just dug up planting holes for the things that I've put in. So we have a hydrangea there. That's a white one called Incredible, which is a ridiculous name, but is a really, really lovely hydrangea. Um, big, big white flowers. Uh, we've got a holly there and then another one over there. Nice variegated ones. This is a, a Cornus controversa variegata. So it's also called a wedding cake tree. And so when these leaves come out, they'll, oh look, we've just got a nice little bud there. Um, so when it grows, nicely. It'll have beautiful variegated uh, white and pale green leaves. This one's a Spirea that very soon will have pretty white flowers on it. You can see at the moment it's just got those little buds um, that look like they're going to be pink but they'll be white. Um, and so I really like the sort of quite vibrant foliage on that one. And then amongst all of this, once we've got more things in here, I'm going to plant various bulbs and shade loving uh, perennials and things because we've got the tree directly above here, which is a copper beech. And so it casts a lot of shade and also looks quite dark. So if I scoot back a bit, I'm trying to plant lighter things here. So there'll be a lot of pale green and white to try and lift that bit of shade up a bit. Uh, so then this is a whole situation that needs dealing with. We've got a lot of ground elder and at the moment I'm just dealing with it in patches, but it's going to be a whole load of work. I don't think I'm ever going to be able to eradicate it completely, but we can try and control it. Oh, I haven't shown you my willows. So along here, we've got little willow cuttings. And there's another one just over there. And so I'm really pleased with how they're sprouting. They will hopefully grow into nice strong plants and they're going to be good for basketry. And they'll also be ornamental while they're growing. Uh, this one is a Viburnum placatum. You can see it's got lots of nice flower buds on there. Uh, this is a Hypericum St. John's wort, which was already here, which I've again cut back dramatically because it was overgrown. So it's, it's beginning to do shoots and grow nicely, but it's just taking a while to recover from being hacked a bit. Another hydra, uh, another Viburnum. This is a big old geranium. It's a purple one. Um, it's not Roseanne, but it's similar. 
Um, this rose was already here. It's a pale pink one, which isn't exactly to my taste, but that's fine. Uh, I've just tied it in to grow along the fence so that we have a bit less of an expansive fence here. But we are lucky that we've got nicely established shrubs. Uh, so this one is a choisia. Um, you can see it's got nice flower buds on it, but it did take a bit of a beating during the snow. And once it's flowered, I pruned it a little bit. Once it's flowered, I'm going to prune it some more. And the same with this one where it's very bare underneath, but then we've got nice flower buds on top. Um, then, you know, more, more ground elder and crocosmia and some Spanish bluebells down there. Eventually we'll get rid of the Spanish bluebells. We do have some native ones down under the hedge at the bottom. Uh, and so we'll try and keep the native ones. Uh, a hydrangea that is the brightest pink that ever did see your retinas. Uh, eventually I'll get rid of that, but at the moment there's nothing to replace it, so it'll do. Um, anemones, tall pink ones, and then these are things that I planted from the old garden. So this is a white buddleia, campanulas, achillea, lupin, more campanula, some rosemary, a hollyhock. And then this um, rose, which is growing on both sides of the fence. Uh, I've sort of tried to thin it out a little on my side. Uh, is again a very, very, very bright pink. And it grows very strongly and has loads of flowers. And it is beautiful and incredible, but also is not remotely my thing. So, yeah. So we've got lots of plans at the moment. Oh, I've just got more, more seedlings here. Broad beans, which need planting out and some backup sweet peas because we've got lots of sweet peas. So yeah, we've got lots of plans, lots of work to do. Um, but as the season progresses, it's going to be quite nice, I think. I hope you enjoyed that little look at the garden. Uh, and as more things come out and I get more work done, I will try and do the occasional update throughout the year. And so you can see how things are coming along. And so, yeah, I think that's all I've got for you today. Um, next time I will have the beginning of a new design to show you which is one I'm really really excited about. Uh, I've just been doing the maths for it and I'm going to be casting on very soon so that is something to look forward to. So I will see you in approximately a month's time and until then bye bye.